So let's talk through some of the strongest and weakest units for the Hammer of the Emperor, and take a look at how a few of the big tanks, infantry and vehicles are shaping up in 40k 10th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Astra Militarum, and looking through each and every unit in the Guard Index, and where I'd roughly rate them in terms of power in 10th edition Warhammer 40k. At present I would probably argue that the Imperial Guard are having a bit of a tough time of it going into 10th, they've definitely got strong options and some interesting synergy within the index, but they're definitely on the lower end of the Warhammer 40k power ranking right now, a win rate of around about 41%, and certainly having a very hard time if they're fighting against any of the top factions in the game. Still though, Guard players are fairly well famed for sticking with their factions throughout thick and thin, such as the nature of holding the line against a galaxy of horrors, and fingers crossed Games Workshop will give the faction a few boosts in the Autumn Balance update. In this video though, I thought we'd talk through a few of the strongest and weakest guard units, things that seem to have been doing okay in tournament lists and are more common competitive selections than others, and the advantages and disadvantages of fielding each one. Guard do have an absolute ton of Forge World choices, much of which I would argue is pretty underwhelming right now, particularly most of the flyers, and in this video I'm afraid I am just going to focus on a few of the more notable Forge World picks for this, and keep the majority of the attention on the index, though I will mention a few of the more notable Forge World pieces that actually see some competitive play. For the many many variants of Baneblade, I thought I'd talk about them in just one entry, do a bit of an overview there, though I have chosen to split up the Rosses in two different sections, perhaps partly because you might just be a bit more likely to field multiple different variants of Rosses per list, unless you're running a big skew super heavy list or something. As always, certainly bear in mind that tier lists in Warhammer 40k are a little bit arbitrary, there's always going to be things that could be a bit higher or a bit lower depending on army context, or just people's opinions on the game. This tier list is made with a combination of community polling and a few of my own opinions, nudging things a little bit one way or the other, and choosing where to draw the tiers. Though of course if you think that anything is ranked a bit too high or too low, mention it down in the comments, always interesting to get some alternative takes and any other uses for units that I might well have overlooked. But with all that being said, let's jump into it. We'll talk through the units in a rough four tiers of army strength, plus a couple of units right at the top that I consider pretty standout. First up, let's start with tier four. These are the units for the Imperial Guard are probably considered towards the weaker end, very overshadowed by other choices, and outside of maybe some weird niche uses, unlikely to make it into competitive lists. First up, we've got Nork Deadog, 70 points, so 30 points more than a regular Ogrim bodyguard, has some okay benefits like devastating wounds on his melee attacks, though overall I think that the regular Ogryn Guard is probably more worth it just at the 40 points, and even then you're sort of dedicating an Ogryn Guard into the units and trying to make it into a somewhat melee threat unit, as opposed to a bit more of a ranged threat, which usually tends to be the case with infantry squads. Maybe not awful if you're trying to build a slightly quirky Katashan melee infantry unit, but a bit passable for most circumstances I think. The Regimental Preacher maybe follows into a similar sort of pattern, Gives you some buffs for melee in squads that generally tend to be kind of underwhelming for it. I think if you really wanted to improve combat in units, you might well be better off with other choices like say Iron Hand Strack and then some Cast Chance perhaps. Could maybe be an edge case include alongside one of those other character combos, but I think it's going to be pretty low down the priority list for a pretty niche for purpose in the first place. And Guard do have really quite a lot of fairly nice support characters to choose from. I think he's just going to get overlooked most of the time for 35 points. Sadly I would rate the Valkyrie down here as well at 200 points, not really too sure why Games Workshop felt that this thing should have a points cost similar to most Rosses despite having far less firepower. There is the possibility of zooming an infantry unit up the board turn 1, move 20 inches then the squad gets out and can open fire with its guns, and that is fun I suppose, but I think it's just nowhere near the 200 point premium that you pay for it when you could get something like a Chimera or a Torox, they still get you a fair distance up the board, but has an absolute fraction of this price. I'm not really the biggest fan of its special rule as well, which gives you a sort of a pseudo rapid ingress for Scions nearby the Valkyrie. It's just far too situational as to where the opponent has positioned units, and you need to make lots of upfront commitments, like having them already in the Valkyrie and choosing not to disembark, and also being sort of on the front lines and hoping you don't get shot down. Next up, the Aegis Defence line I think does have interesting rules, but it's overcosted at 145 points. Fortifications in 40k these days operate a little bit more similar to regular units now, so it would have a bit of an exclusion zone that the enemy couldn't go too close to unless they're charging it, and it gives you a tanky defence line that you get a 4 plus invulnerable save for guard infantry behind it. The ability is nice, but it's not quite worth 145 I don't think, 
Certainly could be fun to play around with with some more casual games, as the invulnerables are kind of nice, but 145 points for something that doesn't do damage just isn't quite there. I think you can have the slightly crazy interaction of Lord Solar ordering it to get his objective control one as well. Definitely by no means a competitive choice or anything like that, but it is kind of funny. Next up we've got the Death Strike Missile Launcher for 160 points. This guy's had a bit of a come down from the enormous damage threat that it was in 9th edition. Kind of a shame as I think they'd actually balanced it fairly well for 9th edition. Usually threatening enormous damage but struggling to land it and meaning it's fairly consistent for shunting enemy units around the board as they try and flee the oncoming threat of the massive missile. Now though, I think that the missile with just damage 1 is far too weak to be considered a serious threat. Quite a lot of enemy units could just literally just accept the damage. I know they've basically wasted a missile launcher that's been the primary purpose of an 160 point vehicle. Plus the Death Strike also unfortunately got the artillery nerf as well, which really wasn't needed for this guy I don't think. It wasn't exactly the Death Strike causing any issues at all compared with the other stronger guard artillery. Finally, for 35 points we've got the Munitorum Servitors. A little squad of four models that could be arresting you for a Tech Priest Engine and chipping into the damage output with some slightly inaccurate multi-melters unless they're static. Generally at 35 points they don't really compete in terms of points for damage or defence compared with the other cheap units that you can get, and even for the role of just being an absolute junk unit to do actions and objectives and screening with, you could still get that better outside of the index with things like the Adeptus Arbiter's Exaction Squad. These were voted the very least on the list by you guys, I think realistically with the value that junk squads can have in 10th edition just to literally free up other units to do other things or prevent them from taking other things or do mission stuff, they could have realistically been tier 3. Not a unit that you exactly take for damage or anything like that, but just to stand there being a unit and scoring some points in some way. Moving onwards though, here in tier 3 we get two units that I consider a bit more overshadowed in the context of the guard index. A fair bit more usable than the ones just talked about. But in general, outside of some fairly niche uses for them, I feel like they're rarely going to be picked as a most optimal selection if you've got other units available, being at least fairly hard to justify compared with other options in the index. First up, the Bulgrins haven't had the best transition to 10th, I don't think. They did keep their 4 plus invulnerable saves and they have got minus 1 damage, but losing the 2 plus save of the Slab Shield means they're far more susceptible to low AP firepower, and they would have absolutely loved to keep the 2 plus save along with all the cover saves that you can get in 10th edition. They can have okay general purpose beat down melee to bully medium and light infantry that will struggle to threaten anything bigger like tanks or vehicles. And I think at this cost it may be just a little bit too costly to be particularly exciting. They also don't really have much synergy with other parts of the codex given that they're auxilia. Next up I have also chosen to rank the Ogrins here as well. Compared with in 9th edition I think they're a lot more similar to each other now as opposed to the Bulgrins being far ahead. The Ogrins are still cheaper at just 25 points per model and are quite a lot less tough than the Bulgrins not getting a 4 plus invulnerable save or the minus 1 damage, but they do actually pack a fair bit of shooting punch now, strength 5, AP 2 and damage 2 ripper guns if you target the closest threat, and they go all the way up to 6 attacks if you can get them within half range. I have seen a few people proposing some fairly crazy and fun sounding options like a big battle boss with a Baneblade equivalent transport with a whole bunch of Ogrins in, and then just overloading the foe with a whole bunch of strength 5 and damage 2 attacks at close range, though I guess they wouldn't get the AP due to not having their special rule. Might be a bit of an impractically high investment, but it does sound fun. Next up we've got the Field Ordnance Batteries for 120 points. These guys were rather unfortunate recipients of the artillery nerf, despite not really being the strongest artillery in the Guard Codex to start with. I think that the Bombast guns are a bit weaker than things like the Manticores or the Basilisks still. It is kind of unfortunate for the other weapon loadouts, the missile launchers and the heavy las cannons. They get hit by the same 20 point nerf as the artillery guns did. I think that overall it's just a bit of an underwhelming unit whichever way you look at it now. Next up we've got the Lehman Rust Tank Commander at 240 points. These guys really have fallen on hard times now. Far less interesting character synergy that you could do previously. And paying an absolutely massive premium compared with the other Rosses. It's 20 points more than even the Demolisher at 240, so really quite bad durability for the cost, even though it does have the Lehman Rust profile. Its special rule is to fire on death, which I think is quite a nice one, but the fact that it only comes into play if you die means that if you're slain, you've still lost a 240 point model, that's just a bit of a consolation prize, and it's effectively going to have no special rules besides his order if the tank does survive the battle and goes on to fire all game long. Having just a single tank order I think is also a little bit sad, I suspect maybe that if it had two of these it would be a bit more tempting. At the moment though it just looks like it competes very poorly with Lord Solar if you do want tank orders. 
Just as of one of the more notable Forge World units, I thought I'd mention the Death Riders of Krieg here. 70 points for 5 of them, or 140 for 10. Basically rough riders, but with some fairly limited anti-infantry style lance attacks, strength 4, AP 1 and damage 1, and the option to take a character to start in the midfield if they'd like to, and a bit of reactive movement if the enemy gets too close. I feel like perhaps the reactive movement could be one of the nicest things, allowing them to do a little bit of skirmishing if the enemy gets too close, and they might be kind of hard to charge first, I suppose. I guess they're okay as some screening skirmishes. I feel like in general you might be better off served with things like sentinels, or just more infantry for the purposes though. Next up we've got the Kazchan Jungle Fighters at 65 points for 10 or 130 for 20. These guys are a unit that I maybe could have ranked a bit higher on the list. I could have happily ranked lower tier 2 or upper tier 3. They're basically a scout move infantry units with flamers and no other special weapon options. And their special rule gives them a little bit more strength and AP on the first round of combat. Which I think genuinely isn't too bad in infantry units holding the front line. They are pretty likely to get charged. They'd have the potential for at least some interesting enough overwatch against lighter infantry with the flamers, and then hopefully tearing a few chunks out of the enemy forces with their AP-1 weapons. I think probably the other infantry squads offer just a little bit more between the support that they can bring, plus some actually more threatening special weapons. Maybe one unit of Kastachans isn't the worst though, maybe in particular it's quite nice for Iron Hand Strachan I think. He can give the squad some lethal hits, plus has his own fairly potent melee profile. I think you could have worse choices than these guys as a brawler squad to hold the midfield early, and also be a potential target for reinforcements if and when the enemy does get through them. Next up for 95 points we have the Hydra, one of the cheapest of the guard support vehicles at the moment, though I can see why they are this cheap with the Hydra autocannons only getting 4 shots now. It's very underwhelming damage output, even if it does re-roll hit rolls against fly, and also has anti-fly 2 plus and twin links. I feel like its damage is passably good against fly targets, but fairly bad against most other things though, and just for cheap wounds with heavy weapons, sentinels I think outcompete this quite handily. I think it'd be a better all round unit if it got a fair few more shots with those auto cannons, even if it had to cost a bit more as attacks for that. The Wyvern are probably also put with the Field Ordnance Batteries as Guard Artillery, but probably not the optimal variety. It gets 2d6 attacks with Strength 5, AP 0, Damage 1, Twin Links, Heavy and Ignore Cover. It's not awful for its damage output, but it's only really effective against light infantry. And even against then, if you compare it to the equivalent points in mortars firing with all the lethal hits and getting multiple copies of the blast keyword rather than just one, I think it's generally going to come out second best. For its positives, at least it's fairly tough for the cost with the vehicle stat line, and it does hand out a minus one to hit as well, which is okay. But when things like the Basilisk and Manticore aren't really all that many points more, I think people are rarely going to look at this guy. Next up we've got the Lehman Rosses that I'd probably consider a little bit less strong than most right now. A Lehman Ross Punisher, Vanquisher and Eradicator. The Punisher's 180 points and short range AP 0 but devastating wounds against infantry. Maybe not bad if you've got anti-armor firepower just absolutely sorted. But I think in 40k at the moment generally lists are trying to struggle to get enough anti-tank, not enough anti-infantry firepower. And Guard often just has a fair bit of chip damage with that with the amount of infantry or stubbers that they can get on vehicles. Maybe just seems a little bit redundant to buy in more of it on a completely specialist platform, but it certainly will stack some saves. The Vanquish is still very scary, a big hitting shot with some massive damage with D6 plus 6, but now it just feels a lot less reliable than it was before. It hits on a 4 plus, not a 3 plus, unless you're stationary, which you might not always be able to afford to be. You might need to move to get line of sight on your target. It's still got the potential to fail the wound roll, even with re-rolls there. And now even when it connects it still has the option to just bounce off an invulnerable save now. It doesn't ignore invulnerables or devastating wounds, which actually makes it a lot less effective against certain targets, particularly as you can bet your opponent would command point reroll any good invulnerable saves they had. Generally just in terms of damage output as well, the Demolisher does beat this fairly solidly. Certainly has a shorter range and its own disadvantages, but seeing as the Demolisher is also very good against things like heavy infantry as well, it just seems like the way to go. Finally the Eradicator's 180 points, Ignores cover is handy in 10th edition, where cover saves are really quite common, but overall I still think it compares kind of horribly just to the regular battle cannon, if nothing else. It's got 3 less strength, doesn't reroll hit rolls on objectives, and gets damage 2 instead of damage 3. I think between the lot of that, the Lehman Ross is going to outcompete the Eradicator, at least against most targets most of the time. Finally we've got a trio of characters which I think will probably be lesser taken out of the guard army. Again more in context of just a lot of other characters offering you a bit more for the points I think. The regular commissar is actually some fairly good immunity against Battleshock. You can execute members of the squad to auto pass a test which could actually be pretty helpful for objectives from time to time. Definitely not awful to have somewhere in the ranks 
Maybe could be okay for a slight luxury pick in a follow-up infantry squad just behind the main battle line, perhaps. Sergeant Harker attaches to Kastchan jungle fighters, gives them stealth at greater than 12 inches away, so a little bit more survivability for them there. And otherwise gives them an order and allows himself to blaze away with his heavy bolter all game long as well. Though I think when you put that all together, it's all just a little bit mid for 60 points compared with other things. Finally, the standard ogre in bodyguard again it is adding combat to a unit that isn't usually very good in combat. Maybe if you had a command squad in a frontline infantry unit and he had 40 points left over that you didn't know what to do with, it could be usable enough. Could just punish your opponent a little bit for trying to lock up an infantry squad with things like space marines. Hopefully he could be able to kill one or two of them in revenge. He's at least fairly tough as well and can help protect some characters from sniper attacks. Moving onwards and on to tier 2. These units in general I'd consider to be pretty effective guard units. Some of them perhaps a little bit more tempting than others I'd say. But broadly speaking I'd say there's maybe a few more arguments to taking these compared with the tier 3 squads, at least for the most part. First up we've got the Tempestus Scions and the Scion Command Squad. Out of these two I'd certainly consider the standard Tempestus Scions the better out of the two of them. The Tempestus Command Squad is a bit of a maybe upgrade compared with the regular Scions I think. And the Tempestus Scions themselves I would be kind of tempted to rank up towards tier 1 potentially. They are handy to have around both for a bit of fairly high power special weapon fire against units on objectives where they get re-rolls against them and also just dropping in to satisfy the criteria for secondary objectives as well. Maybe trying to get in the opponent's deployment zone or into the corners or engage points. I think for 60 points that's really not too bad, particularly with two free specials. And then if you did want to build around a big Scion damage strategy, you could go for the Command Squad. That's 80 points to give them sustained hits 1, med packs, extra objective control, the master vox and allowing double orders potentially. I do think that the order sequencing is a bit unfortunate with them though. You can't issue orders if you're in deep strike or if you're in a transport. So I guess they're generally going to be taken for their other buffs more so than that. Can give you a really quite a big hefty scion punch though. Potentially 15 models in the squad dropping in and blazing away with some pretty efficient special weapons. Next up, the Kazakin I think got a lot less exciting in 10th edition. As an opposite to the Scions, I'd probably rank these a bit further down the rankings here, maybe upper tier 3 to lower tier 2. I think they're a bit on the pricey side now really, at 120 points for the squad of 10 of them, and don't get quite as many stacking synergies as they had before, while still being fairly fragile in defence, so you need to invest in delivering them, probably using a transport like a Torox or a Chimera. They do bring a fair amount of interesting special weapons though, one big sniper shot, and that melter mine that could deal a bunch of mortal wounds. If you can manage to start them on the board as well, they get an extra order as well, and get to move into the midfield either on foot or in their transport with scouts. The special weapon damage output I think really isn't awful, but they just may be a bit harder to deliver than some of them. I'd probably be a bit more tempted by the Tempestus Scions at the moment. Next up, the heavy weapon squad is 60 points for the three bases. Still very, very fragile for the cost. It could perhaps give you some backfield last cannons if you're feeling a bit brave, but I think that most of the direct fire weapons are still are really going to suffer from just being able to be shot down so easily and being high priority targets for your opponent with how easy they are to kill. In reality, I think it's still probably the mortars that are going to be the biggest attention seekers here. A few squads of these hiding out of line of sight will definitely stack a bunch of saves on an enemy unit, particularly if they're a big 20-man block of something like Necron Warriors or Enemy Guard perhaps. You could be getting an awful lot of extra shots from the blast, and they'll all be triggering the lethal hits with Born Soldiers, still paying a bit of a premium and very dedicated to killing lighter infantry as opposed to heavier things. I suppose at least Space Marines can't get their save improved from a 3 to a 2 against them, so I guess that's something. Again, like the rest of the artillery though, still competing against things like Basilisks and Manticores, which are very good. Next up, we've got the Rattling Snipers. At 70 points, they're definitely charged at a premium compared with the 50 that they were before. And these guys can start on the midfield, maybe being an annoying presence on hidden safe midfield objectives and doing a bit of move shoot move shenanigans, shooting a few sniper shots and then retreating back to safety. In the right situation, if they can just keep on doing that turn on turn, they're probably going to do enough damage to justify their points against characters if the opponent has them. If the opponent does catch up with them with anything though, they are going to be very easy to kill. Toughness 2 isn't going to last long even with stealth. Might have been a bit generous to these guys, ranking them up in tier 2. Again, could have been a tier 3 unit, I think, probably on the lower end of this. Infiltrate units, I think, are kind of handy to have. Maybe just one of them as a bit of a luxury to hold down the midfield and do some sniping shenanigans. Next up, we've got the other two flavours of infantry squad, the standard one and the Cadian shock troops. 
Out of the four flavours of infantry, I'd say that Death Corps Krieg are probably my favourite one at the moment, but they all have their own advantages with their special rules, and some advantages with their equipment and characters. The standard infantry squad is one of the most flexible in terms of characters that can join them, and if you want a bit more of a longer range static infantry squad, they can bring some heavy weapons to the table as well. Getting a couple more hidden last cannons in a unit is kind of nice. I do really quite like the way that they get the benefit of cover if they're in range of an objective marker as well. That's really quite handy to have to make them tough at range, and you could also double down on that go to ground order to improve their save even further, provided the opponent's got at least some AP to stop the stacking saves capping out. The Cadian Shock Troops, on the other hand, might be the option to go for for slightly more aggressive units, getting special weapons rather than the heavies. They might be preferable to Kriegsmen for certain characters that can't join them, things like the Cadian Castellan or Ursula Kreis. And they also get the sticky objectives rule, the one where it remains under your control once the squad's been shot dead or moved on or whatever, which I think is a little bit niche and situational, but just occasionally that is going to be worth flat victory points to you. It's definitely a nice rule just to have on a unit that's going to be going for objectives anyway. Next up we've got the Rough Riders. I feel like I've been saying this for quite a few of them, but again, probably lower tier 2 or borderline tier 3 here. Perhaps out of the dedicated guard melee units, one of the slightly better ones. Only 80 points, so quite a lot significantly cheaper than they were previously, but also a bit less threatening in combat, with only one attack per rider, but you still get the nice choice between the blast or the melter lance. Might be alright for a counter charge unit hidden amongst the ranks and bursting out of terrain. I probably overall wouldn't go too heavy on them though. Next up we've got a couple of battle line Lehman Rosses. These ones solid enough and with a bit more range than the Demolisher, I think they do have a niche. The Lehman Ross battle tank is 195 points and gets the reroll hits thing against units on objectives, perhaps making up for the battle cannon a bit which I feel lost out a bit in the transition from 9th edition to 10th edition. It still seems a bit less efficient against heavier targets than it used to be though. The same seems kind of true for the Executioner as well, 195 points so costing the same. This one's a lot more niche and focused on actually killing its primary target now, Elite Infantry. D6 plus 3 shots with strength 8, AP 3 and flat 3 damage is very nice for killing things like Custodes or Terminators. Probably going to be rivaling the Demolisher a little bit once more, which has some very scary damage output and can threaten heavies as well. But it does have longer range and it's a bit cheaper, even if you are risking the hazardous rolls. Next up, the Hellhound I think is fairly cheap and effective at 125 points and kind of helpful for the whole guard shooting synergy thing as well. If you take the Inferno Cannon, then they've got some pretty solid overwatch that you can park next to objectives, a great big strength 6 AP-2 flamer with 2d6 shots, plus a heavy flamer as backup. And if you take the anti-vehicle melter version, it's not too bad at 18-inch range, but gets seriously quite scary if you can get even a single wound through at within 9 inches at d6 plus 4 damage. Either way, if you can hit a target with one of the guns, it can remove the benefit of cover for that unit, and that's really quite handy given how easy it is to get in 10th edition, and how it can be quite meaningful for a lot of units with high saves. I feel like it's a pretty nice unit to maybe have one or two of in the battle line, though I still say that for both profiles the damage output isn't super outstanding. Okay against this dedicated target, but kind of bad if you can't find one within 18 inches. Next up we've got the Baneblade variant, which in reality should probably be ranked all over the place the same as the Lehman Rosses, I thought just for ease of talking about them we'd just focus on them here. I'd argue that probably the better Baneblade variants would probably be a strong tier 2 choice, definitely usable enough, and kind of interesting to have some really massive vehicles to stack synergies and things on. A few enemy armies are going to really struggle to get through that toughness 13, 24 wounds and 2 plus save, particularly as it usually should be fairly easy to gain cover and last cannons are going to be wounding them on fives. If you're running one, I think it will be probably tempting both to be running Lord Solar and the Tech Priest Engine Seer. You could have your big behemoth with a 4 plus invulnerable save, some healing and hitting with a plus 1 to hit, all of which definitely make it a lot more attractive overall. The spawns and weapons can be pretty interesting for the sheer amount of flamethrowers they can take as well, could certainly barbecue some enemy infantry units getting onto objectives with a whole bunch of re-rolling wound shots. For the individual variants, I'd say that there's arguments that you could make for a fair few of them. A few like the Hellhammer in particular I think feel kind of weak for the cost. I asked you which ones that you were liking at the moment the most, and the Shadow Sword seems to be the winner from your guys' vote, perhaps just embracing the pure power trip that is that enormous volcano cannon with a massive damage 12. It is very swingy though, depending on whether you get any damage at all out of it, though it is also one of the cheaper variants at 440 points. The Baneblade with a built-in Demolisher Cannon I think is another very good all-rounder, 
The Bane Swords also got pretty strong longer range anti tank damage, and I really like the special rule for that one to give you a better chance to trigger deadly demise on a key vehicle. It really could be game changing if you explode a certain very high deadly demise value in the middle of the opponent's army. And for the transport variants, I really quite like the Doom Hammer. Personally, I feel like it's probably the better choice over the Storm Lord for the gun that it gets, and you could do some quirky tactics with it, like filling it full of heavy weapons, or Ogrins with Ripper guns potentially and get within 9 inches, then hit a bit better due to Lord Solar orders. Realistically, that's probably a bit too much investment in one big unit, but does sound very fun indeed. For downsides, they certainly can have problems with terrain on certain closer maps, there might be areas of the board that they just can't go into. And despite a tough profile, some armies are just going to be able to chew through that depressingly easily. It's not really going to be a tank that you can effectively hide. Overall though, I'd say they're broadly usable in 10th edition, though some variants a lot more so than others, and they are kind of terrain dependent. Next up we've got the Guard Transport, all usable enough for what they do. A Chimera 85 points, Torox for 65, and the Torox Prime for 90, all good enough with their pros and cons. I feel like they might be a little bit more outstanding if high damage close range infantry were a bit better, Perhaps in particular Kazakin, if they were super efficient, then these things would be a bit more taken. I think that all of them are usable and relatively well balanced. The Chimera gets you a little bit more toughness and better guns, I think, with the last gun arrays and Hunter Killer Missile included. Plus has the mobile command vehicle thing, which can be fun for orders. The Torox is the cheap and cheerful option, really very cheap and 20 points less than the Chimera. Plus it's a little bit faster and can transport 12 now, so big improvements there if you just want a focus ride to get you to the front. And the Torox Prime is the Scion transport option, unfortunately just as easy to kill as the regular Torox, so will go down to things like Plasma Fire fairly fast, but does actually come with a bit more firepower than it, and hits on Ballistic Skill 3+, plus, which is pretty nice for Guard. It also gives any Tempestus Scions re-roll wound rolls when they jump out of it, and that could be seriously nasty if you manage to get them jumped out near an objective, Rerolling all hits and all wounds potentially is going to make those special weapons very happy indeed. Overall I'd say that maybe one or two of them could be handy enough to deliver some squads onto objectives or special weapons in range, though probably not quite enough to really be exciting enough to spam entire squadrons of them of mechanised infantry. Next up for another slightly more standout Forge World choice we've got the Rapier Laser Destroyers, 30 points each or 60 or 90 for a unit of 3. And if you want a last cannon style heavy weapon team, I think there's some good arguments that you could make for these guys over the regular heavy weapon squad or over the field ordnance last cannons. Each one of them gets two shots at 36 inches, strength 12, AP 2 and damage D6 plus 1. I think that's actually a fairly fearsome profile for 30 points each per model and has fairly good range as well. And at least compared with the heavy weapons teams, they're not quite as trivially easy to kill. Three wounds at toughness 4 and a 4 plus save, though their durability still definitely isn't good. Still though, when you could be getting 18 shots at that profile with the reroll wound rolls for 270 points, I feel like that is at least fairly scary backfield fire support. Now you could have been slightly towards the upper end of tier 2 perhaps. Next up for a few more characters, we've got the Cadian Castellan at 50 points and Iron Hand Strachan at 80. These ones I think are far more worth it than the ones that were ranked down in tier 3. Could be the right choice for the right squad. The Cadian Castellan gives you a nice flat damage boost with sustained hit 6s for your Cadian infantry moving into the midfield. Pretty nice to make them more dangerous. And they can also fall back and shoot as well. That's absolutely excellent to have on a big investment squad in the midfield. Means that your opponent can't just charge them with something and have them locked up and know that all their guns are out of the fight. Between that and an order seems like a pretty good all-round package for 50 points. I think it's a pretty solid option for optimising infantry for damage dealing and making sure that they'll keep on chipping away at the foe. Strachan for 80 points on the other hand, he's all about being a frontline combat guard commander. I think he is pretty interesting along with a cast chan squad. I do quite like the way that he's got the potential to reroll all hits and wounds in melee which is nice. It gives the squad lethal hits, which will help it out a bit against the toughest stuff around, and also has two orders as well, so it's quite efficient for that, one for his squad and one for something nearby. I think it does look effective enough to run alongside a big blob of cast chans maybe. Have a tough squad on objectives that's actually relatively dangerous both with overwatch and in combat, and if the opponent charges them with a sort of medium strength combat unit, Strachan's going to hit them back very hard. Next up, for 75 points, there's Sly Marbo. An infiltrator and lone operative these days, and lone operatives just in general are kind of handy to have on the board. Units the opponent just might not be able to do anything about until they can dedicate units to move up and try and hunt them down. Can be very nice for both their secondary objectives and occasionally primaries. For his actual damage, he comes with a whole bunch of strength 5, AP 1, and damage 2 attacks with both anti infantry 2 plus and precision. Against the right character, he could have a very good chance of just killing one character right out of an enemy squad. 
He is likely to land a whole bunch of attacks on the target that make them take saves. He also gets move shoot move as well and a sort of reactive fire mechanic that could be handy enough provided he actually survives the enemy shooting. I think he's just about usable as a bit more of a fun pick maybe. For hyper optimised lists I sort of feel like you might be weighing him up versus things like the Imperial Assassins which are also kind of nice. Particularly the Vindicare who might well be able to kill characters just as well but from a longer distance. Next up we've got the Regimental Attaches which are basically the Master of Ordnance and his two backup dancers. The Master of Ordnance can give you sustained hits one with your artillery weapons against one target that he can see. And that seems like another very nice damage boost that you can all layer on one target among the various other things that Guard can do to just really turn up the heat on one unit and then just hit them with everything that they've got. Depends whether or not you think that's worth 40 points in addition to a command squad somewhere on a big squad in the midfield probably. I say the other two members of the unit are kind of niche. The Astropath stops nearby Deep Strike, so that does require him to be right on the front line. And the Officer of the Fleet buffs Guard Flyers, but unfortunately Games Workshop have made all of them very bad indeed at the moment. Finally, for 115 points, there's Gaunt's Ghosts. The syllabus of a weird mishmash, non-focused unit, but they do bring some pretty interesting things to the table. And again, like Sly Marbo are interesting enough lone operatives, and they're able to jump on and off the board and deep strike multiple times per game. That in itself is kind of handy for secondary objectives, or even just taking the fights to a weak exposed infantry unit that might be on a home field objective perhaps. Lone operative will keep them safe from any shooting that's outside of 12 inches, so provided they're not super aggressive, they should survive quite well. And then if the enemy does get close, they always get cover, have stealth and they have two wounds apiece so they are a squad that's not going to die immediately unless the opponent can focus some fire. They've also got two orders that can either help themselves out or nearby other units in the midfield like sentinels maybe and each of the squad has at least something interesting going on for their combat weapons taken as a whole they're probably best at bullying lighter infantry but they will do that at least fairly effectively. Definitely not one that's going to be carrying the main damage and defense game but could be helpful in skirting around the peripheries and hoovering you up some points and picking off weak things in the enemy army. Moving on though, now we're on to tier 1. These are some of the units that I consider some of the strongest picks in the guard index right now. Though I have chosen to set two units aside just for a special mention at the end, perhaps a level above these. First up, and probably a surprise to no one, is that the guard artillery that I've been mentioning for most of the video is ranked up here. Very solidly basilisks, manticores and the earthshaker carriages. Maybe the Medusa carriage being an okay pick, though probably a little bit behind the other three in my opinion. On release I thought that the Guard Artillery was pretty much hands down some of the strongest things in the entire army, though since then Games Workshop have nerfed indirect fire a bit, they basically cranked up the points cost of all of these guys, but I'd say not to the point of unusability, I still rate them as one of the strongest aspects of the Guard Index, but just probably no longer head and shoulders above everything else now. Ignore's line of sight firepower in Warhammer 40k is really helpful for all sorts of reasons, being able to whittle down enemy objective scorers to deny them points or just finish off an injured unit that's just about to deal some massive damage to you but if you can just plink off a few more wounds then it's going to be a massive deal or just literally stacking the damage output in on exactly the unit that needs it most. Guard have got loads of options for making the artillery stronger as well. One of their stratagems can buff the damage output, the Master of Ordnance can get them sustained hits, Sentinels can make them better, the Lemurus Exterminator that we'll get onto, and they can get orders as well. For the actual options for the Guard artillery, the Basilisk I still think is solid at 135 points. This one gives you d6 plus 3 shots at strength 8, AP 2 and damage 2, perhaps most ideally suited to killing Space Marines. Though for all of these standing stationary means that they'll be a bit more effective at killing anything heavy with the lethal hits that you get for born soldiers that don't generally have to move. The Basilisk can also hand out really quite a big minus 2 inch to move advance and charge debuff on the enemy unit it's targeting as well. That can be absolutely massive in certain matchups to keep some key infantry out of the game. Perhaps things like Space Marine Terminators or Custodian Guard or something will probably be a good example. Jumping ahead to the Earthshaker carriage and that basically gets you the same as a Basilisk but hitting on Ballistic Skill 5. The heavy keyword counteracting the indirect penalty. The damage output is perhaps a little bit better than the Basilisk now though it doesn't come on quite a sturdy a platform and can't move and fire hunter killers or heavy bolters but it does still hand out the same debuff. I feel like having at least one of these in an army for that reason is really quite strong between the actual damage and the debuff. For overall raw damage output I think that the Manticore is perhaps a little bit more impressive than the Basilisk. Only d6 plus 1 shots but strength 10, AP 2 and a big damage 3 is going to be massively better against some heavier targets and it also gets a really nice rule where you get to re-roll full hit rolls against things which have 5 or more models in them. Very nice for things like Terminators and can also maybe net you a few more lethal hits auto wounds as well. 
Quite nice that the Storm Eagles are no longer limited to just four shots per game too. Finally, as mentioned, I'd say that probably the Medusa carriage is perhaps the most niche of these. I still think it competes at least okay though. D6, Strength 10, AP3 and Damage 3 shots. Quite a good profile against heavier things and Terminators. I would say its special rule isn't anywhere near as good as the Manticores, just handing out a little bit of battle shock. Overall, still very strong and Guard can still go for Artillery Parking Lot if they really want to. But after the nerfs, you might just be a little bit strapped for damage output overall if you do, and winning the main battle in the midfield. I think the vast majority of lists will take at least some of this though. Otherwise, another very strong unit for the guard at the moment are the Armoured Sentinels, and we might be talking about the Scout ones later. The Armoured Sentinels at 70 points for really quite a tough profile for that. Toughness 8, a 2 plus save, which they can probably easily get cover on quite a lot of the time, and 7 wounds. Then a Hunter Killer, and maybe either a Plasma Cannon or a Laz Cannon, and they get reroll wound rolls against vehicles as well, which is quite nice, though their damage output still isn't super outstanding, even against them, I think. They do have the regiment keywords to allow them to be directly ordered, and can be recycled as reinforcements as well, being kind of notable for that purpose. As they're the single most high-costed unit that you can do the two command point reinforcement recycle with, overall pretty nice to have on the front line, exactly the sort of unit that you probably want your opponents trying to damage and destroy, and can chip in with some fairly dangerous anti-tank fire, that's at least going to worry your opponent's units and can't be completely ignored. Next up, we've got the Death Corps Infantry Squad, 65 points for 10 of them and 130 for 20. I would currently rate these as the strongest out of the Guard Infantry right now. A good amount of special weapons in the unit if you want to take them and sacrifice the Vox. Maybe two Plasma, two Grenade Launchers and two Melters can have some fairly good close range damage. And particularly in a bigger unit, you might well get the squad partially damaged but not destroyed, and then when that happens, they actually get some surprisingly potent damage rules when the squad's depleted, plus one to hit when they're less than full strength, and plus one to wound when they're less than half. He also gets to restore some models each turn with the meta pack as well, kind of nice on a midfield objective scoring unit, could be nice enough to just put a little bit more objective control just before you score a point. Overall seems really quite nice, and another big argument for them is taking the death core of Krieg Marshall as well. He's very nice toughness support for them. Next up, we've got a couple of Lehman Rosses. For the most part, I'd say that the Guard Direct Fire tanks are failing a little bit on the lower power end of the scale compared with some of the other tanks in Warhammer 40k right now. But since all the artillery went up in points a bit, I think they're far more worthy of consideration. And in particular, the Lehman Ross Demolisher and the Lehman Ross Exterminator, they'd be the two units that I'd be most likely to pick first out of the Rosses. First up, the Lehman Ross Demolisher is just generally the most all-round dangerous one. It is the most expensive at 220, but it still seems to be the most dangerous against the majority of targets per point, and particularly so against anything particularly heavy, like Toughness 12 or Toughness 14 targets. The Demolisher Cannon gets your D6 plus 3, Strength 14, AP3 and Damage D6 rounds. That's pretty universal in that there's just not really many units in 40k that want to get hit by that kind of profile, and wounding things like Knights on a 3 plus is very nice indeed. It does need to get close a bit, but at least I guess that could combine well with trying to get multi melter sponsons into range as well, could make it very intensely dangerous at close range, and it also gets the special rule which means that if you charge you can still fire your blast weapons directly into combat, so at least compared with previous editions it's not quite as critical to screen these 100% all the time. Having the blast weapon locked up still doesn't mean that you can't shoot at the target that is locking you up now. Overall seems fairly scary, I'd say that for 220 points though its durability probably still is the main downside, dedicated anti-tank will still probably kill it slightly depressingly quickly for how much it costs. Otherwise, the Lehman Ross Exterminator is 200 points. This one's got a fairly general purpose auto cannon that's kind of similar in profile to the Battle Cannon, just being a rapid fire 4 weapon. 4 shots out to 48 inches, or 8 shots to 24 inches. It's also twin linked as well, so it gets the reroll wound rolls all the time, whereas the Battle Tank only gets the reroll hit rolls if you're targeting something on an objective. I say that's maybe a win overall for the Exterminator. Definitely helps it punch off a little bit against the tougher tanks out there. And then perhaps the single biggest reason to take it might be that it buffs attacks by an extra AP minus one. One unit that gets hit by the Exterminator Auto Cannon will then be easier to kill for the rest of your guard army. And everything from Lasguns to Manticore missiles will all be AP minus one more effective against that target. Really very nice for focus firepower, and you could certainly combine it with other focus buffs, say for example Hellhounds or Sentinels marking the target. Overall definitely seems quite nice to have, as handing out a little bit of extra AP to the units that need it most. Next up, and a bit more of a general purpose direct damage and durability beast, is the Rogal Dawn Battle Tank. It's 285 points now, which is a little bit more than the base value in 9th edition, 
but with the regular rosters going up so much, it's really not all that much of an upgrade compared with what it was, and it remains a very solid all-rounder with a whole ton of guns, a lot of which are pretty scary. Perhaps the standout thing for it is its durability. 18 wounds at toughness 12 and a 2 plus save I think is a bit more impressive than the regular rosses. The toughness 12 means that last cannons will wound on a 4 plus, not a 3. Should probably be easy enough to get it some cover with that enormous profile, just tow one tiny bit of it behind a ruin. And it's got a rather nice special rule where once per game you get to change a single damage characteristic to 0. That's really quite nice against the right guns if you can negate an enormous melter shot or even better, something that's got even crazier damage like a Necron Gauss weapon with damage 6. That could effectively gain you an extra 6 wounds worth of tank if you're shot out by the right thing. I think the guns are quite nicely general purpose. I'd probably still be tempted by the Oppressor Cannon over the Twin Battle Cannon for the extra AP that it has. And it's got quite a lot of general purpose secondary weapons beyond that. Being quite a big chunky tank, it's also quite nice for any focal buffs that you might have. Say Lord Solar Orders or Tech Police Engine Seers giving it out invulnerable saves and repairs. Next up, for character units that are considered fairly strong, there's the command squads. I'm perhaps more tempted by the regular one as they can go in the Death Corps of Krieg units, though if you're using some of the other flavours of infantry squad, you could think about the Cadian command squad. They can go with the shock troops. Just to start with, they do get you an extra 5 miniatures in the unit, which I think isn't nothing. More bodies for the enemy to kill, and the commander's got a few more wounds. And then beyond that, can give a fair few fairly meaningful buffs that go quite a long way on a big massed up infantry unit. A 6 plus feel no pain to hopefully keep a few more of them alive. An extra bit of objective control to get them scoring even more powerfully. A single order that could be broadcast with a master vox, so it could go to something further away if it made sense. And then yet another further buff on top of that. The platoon one maybe being a bit niche, allowing you to still do stratagems even if battle shocks. The Cadian one maybe being a little bit more tempting. The Cadian one ignoring modifiers, which I guess could be helpful for combating things like stealth. They're also the way that you could allow yourself to unlock things like the attaches or the bodyguard if you want. Both of those I think could be alright, but are maybe a bit more niche than the command squad itself. And depending on what specialists and things, you might have a little bit more actual threat in the unit as well. You could take one or two special weapons, and the commander might score a wound or two in combat from time to time with power swords. I think the combined offering for the cost really is quite nice. Good value characters for really quite a cheap buy-in. Next up, we've got a couple of more durability slanted characters. The Death Corps Marshal is 60 points. He gives a 5 plus fill no pain type save to the unit, which is really quite excellent for a bigger squad. Particularly great for infantry in the midfield, which generally need to be more survivable than they really do in terms of dealing damage. Plus he does get you an order and a free insane bravery once per game as well. Again, a very nice hat to have thing for a unit that wants to be taking objectives. He's really quite a common include at the moment for a cheap 60 points, making the Guardsman really quite a lot more resilient to damage one firepower in particular. And he can go with the Kriegsman who can regenerate models, making you a very tanky squad indeed. Then, and potentially combining with the Death Corps Marshal if you really want to, even if the Kriegsmen themselves, I understand, aren't particularly fond of the Psychers, is a Primaris Psyker. 60 points for them, and they give you a 4 plus and vulnerable save psychic power. Again, excellent news for a massed up infantry unit. A 4 plus save against psychic attacks, which are at least fairly common enough in certain armies in Warhammer 40k, will be good for Thousand Sons, or against certain Tyranid firepower. And then actually fairly strong damage from Psychic Maelstrom as well, chipping in a bunch of Strength 6, AP 2 and Damage 2 shots at close-ish range. They would have to risk a hazardous roll for that, and you'd better have a CP on standby as a failed one would kill the Psyker. Between these two you can have a fairly fantastically durable infantry squad. A 4 plus invulnerable and a 5 plus feel no pain are all rather good, then maybe regenerate models with the Death Corps med pack. Next up there's a Regimental Engine Seer for 45 points. He can be a lone operative next to vehicles, so he doesn't need a retinue to stand around while he buffs the tanks. I feel like with the cost of both Lehman Rosses and the Rogal Dawns at the moment, he's a pretty reasonable choice on either, giving them a 4 plus invulnerable save and healing a vehicle for D3 wounds as well. The 4 plus invulnerable is absolutely excellent and is going to help them out the most against things that have very high AP. Last cannons and melter guns won't be very effective, though it might be a little bit redundant if they do have cover. And then for just a very cheap 45 point support character, I'm kind of surprised at how good his melee is. 4 attacks at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2, odds on to kill a space marine at least. And that goes up to a big 7 attacks if a nearby vehicle dies at some point in the game as he goes into Tech Priest Nerd Rage mode. Obviously his main value is to pile more wounds and defence onto nearby rosters and vehicles and stop them taking damage in the first place. But kind of fun that later in the game he could actually do something meaningful if he rolls kind of well with that combat. 
Finally for this tier, we've got Ursula Creed at 55 points. She's one who I might have been ranking it up with the special mention units in just a second. The Games Workshop did nerf her at least fairly significantly recently. Now her free stratagems are locked to regimental units nearby, as opposed to just any units in your army. And it's a bit sad for certain units like tanks and things that could have got the minus one damage stratagem from her. Though it is still handy to be able to access the guard stratagems for cheap on the infantry and sentinel type units. I would bear in mind she can't use her free stratagems on the reinforcement stratagem as well. Technically that happens when the unit's already dead, so it's off the board and not within range of her aura. Otherwise though, I still think that she's a very solid choice just for 55 points and allowing a free stratagem every turn. Really quite a low buy-in for that. Two orders are nice, and a little bit of pistol and power weapon threat doesn't go amiss either. Obviously that's a bit of a bonus if that does anything though. Finally, I just thought we'd mention the two units that I think maybe stand out above the rest of the pack for the Imperial Guard. For sheer value for the points cost, I feel like these probably are placed above even things like the durable Death Corps infantry and the artillery with a good indirect fire. First up, Lord Solar Leontus for 125 points, feels like one of the most auto-take units in the Guard Codex right now. He automatically farms one command point per turn, which I think already makes up a good chunk of his 125 point value then and there. Extra stratagem to deliver other big swings to the game, could be fed into things like getting reinforcement units back, or smoke on tanks, or whatever else. Otherwise, beyond that though, he's also absolutely key, as basically he's still remaining the god of orders. He gets to order three Astro Militarum units within six inches of him, and unlike the rest of the units, he is unlimited to literally anything in the army. He can order things like Bane Blades and Super Heavies, auxilia like Ogryn or Bulgrin. That's by far the best source of tank orders, oddly enough. The regular tank commander just getting the one for 240 points, whereas Lord Solar gets three for 125. He can strangely order the Aegis defense lines, as we mentioned before as well, just in case you want them to uphold the honor of the Emperor and stand firm and get plus one objective control. Then beyond that, he's even got a redeployability, where there's three different units that you can redeploy after deployment. You don't get to know who's going first at that point, but it still can be kind of helpful. Say if there was a unit that your opponent's just got some easy lines of sight to, if they do go first, you might just be able to nose that behind your own terrain and keep it a little bit more safe. And you can also use it to unexpectedly return things to the strategic reserve as well, which could mess with your opponent's plans. Then besides that, if most of his command work is done and the enemy does get too close, he can be some okay counter charge against elite infantry. Things like space marines are quite easy to kill for him. And 8 wounds with a 4 plus invulnerable save is not too bad in terms of defence for an 125 point character. Maybe not stand out in terms of the damage or defence or anything, but that's not really the point in the first place. Overall, just seems kind of hard for virtually any guard list to go too far wrong by taking Lord Solar. Some of the most efficient orders around, plus extra CP, hard to go too far wrong. Otherwise, the second unit that I thought was worthy of a special mention were the Scout Sentinels. Again, these guys are so good right now that I'd consider them borderline also include for more competitive guard lists. Again, just for such a cheap buy-in, they bring a whole load to the table. As for the Armoured Ones, perhaps standout durability for the cost. 50 points for toughness 7, a 3 plus save and 7 wounds is just standout good for durability. Most enemy guns, even anti-tank ones, aren't going to be enormously efficient against that, soaking up far more firepower than they're really worth. They do also have the smoke keyword as well, which could make them yet harder to kill if you really wanted to invest something. Their firepower, like the armoured ones, are still rated as not particularly standout, though at least per point you do get more counter-killer missiles and more shots, they just won't get any re-rolls against armoured targets like the armoured ones get. As regiment units, they can also be ordered by officers that are infantry as well, not just the ones that can do tank orders. Unlike the armoured sentinels, they get a scout move as well, so perhaps one of the best units to be pushing up to the midfield and force the opponent to have to deal with their good durability. They do have a little bit of objective control that they could take some points with early, though are probably not going to be holding anything against infantry units. If the opponent does charge them, they've got a tiny bit of melee that they can contribute with their chainsaw. Not going to be enough to really threaten whole units, but will likely do a little bit of chip damage. And then perhaps one of their best abilities is their ability to just amp up guard firepower. Mark one unit that they can see. Anything else in your army that shoots that unit gets to reroll hit rolls of one, which is a useful enough boost in itself. But then also for indirect fire, they won't suffer the penalty to the hit roll for firing out of line of sight with their heavy weapons. Then of course, like the armoured sentinels, if you had a big squad of three of them that get killed by the enemy having to slog through the defence, 
and you can just recycle them for 2 CP for reinforcements and have them stomp back onto the board. Overall, it just seemed like a unit that your opponent's probably going to struggle to come out on top against, even if they do wind up investing damage against them. They might just have a little bit too much firepower to really be ignored, and also acts as a nice synergy piece, as well as disrupting the enemy army with some tough vehicles moving forward. Overall, rather excellent. I would say that the Scout Sentinels are a pretty good vanguard to have in the army at the moment. So anyway, with the Scout Sentinels talked about, that brings us to the end of our look at the Imperial Guard units, and a quick ranking of their power throughout the Index. Let me know your thoughts on the units yourselves down in the comments below, which ones are you rating highest or lowest in the game right now, and what are the things that have done standout performances on the table. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, or certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I'm sure we'll have more for the Guard in the future. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.